Welcome to Weight Loss and Wellness for Real, the podcast where people like you get the practical solutions and support you need to permanently lose the physical and mental weight so you can feel better and live the life you really want to live in the body and mind you really want to be living in. If you're looking to overcome your stress eating, overeating, binging behaviors, and move to a place of food and body freedom, as well as find more meaning and more moments of joy in life, you are in the right place. Hey everyone, thanks for being here, sharing this space with me today. Just a reminder, you can head to my website, heatherheinen.com. Heinen is spelled H-E-Y-N-E-N. You can head over there and sign up for my free monthly newsletter um, on all things well-being. I also always include a high protein recipe and there are also discount codes included for different products that help support the show. I do have with me today a very special guest. His name is Eric Edmeads and he is a very interesting interesting person. You're really going to enjoy this. He's a wonderful storyteller. He is also a global citizen with a unique perspective on life. He was born in South Africa, raised in Canada. He's traveled all over the world. Um, He has done things from mobile computing to Hollywood special effects. I know the studio that he used to own uh, did work with Avatar and the Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, But he is here today because he's not just this incredible entrepreneur, he also started a program called Wild Fit. And so this is all things health and wellness and why he is here. Um, Wild Fit has improved the lives of over 100,000 people in more than 130 countries. Really a testament to his innovative approach to health and well-being. I heard about Eric, I, I saw him interviewed by Jordan Peterson this summer and sort of um, was interested in what he had to say there and so started following him and kind of got more information. And he and I really have very similar philosophies on helping people to live their best lives, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. So he has an upcoming book called The Evolution Gap, A Survival Guide for Modern Civilization. We talk about that in this interview and you can purchase it. There are digital copies available on Amazon. You can purchase it there. He did ask if you do that to leave a review, uh, but it will be coming out Uh, in paper form, in real book form uh, soon. And he also has another book that is going to be released the end of March called Post-Diabetic. So he has those two books coming out. Uh, His work on the evolution gap, it really explores that the growing divide between our slow moving biological evolution and um, our extraordinary capacity to innovate rapidly. So During our conversation, Eric's going to share some insights on this, which also can be applied on a practical level to health and well-being, weight loss. We do talk about diet. We talk about veganism, carnivore. We get into all of it. Um, So I want you to really take a close listen. Try to pull some things out of this episode that you can maybe start to incorporate today, something that feels doable, something you can do on the daily. Um, I'm really hoping this episode and the conversation with Eric will help inspire you to make some changes in your daily life. Well, nice to meet you. I'm a fan, so it's kind of fun to have you here. Oh, that's great. I'm I'm (laughs) glad. How, How did that happen? Yeah. So I saw your interview with Jordan Peterson uh-huh. and yeah. So from that started kind of just got involved in some of your stuff and started following you. And we have, um, really, really similar philosophy. I saw from your podcast. That's a great time. That was a here. super fun experience with Jordan. He's a, he's a, he's a good man. So wondering if maybe you just start out sharing. I know um, you, you had some illness as a kiddo and that was kind of your first introduction to food as maybe healing, maybe you could start there. So, uh, you know, the funny thing about being ill when you're a kid is that um, if it creeps up on you slowly, you don't really know that you're ill. You just think you're you, you know? So yeah, I always true. had, it, you know, allergies. I, I was a little overweight. I, I, then I developed acne and these things just all became part of my identity. I, I didn't think of myself as being ill, but my parents, they did. And so, you know, and my, I came from a medical family, so it was like, let's go see the doctor. Let's get the next script. Let's try the next pill, the next injection, the next right, inhalant. Right. Eventually, surgery was was on the cards. And then, uh, and then, funny enough, I went to a Tony Robbins seminar in uh, mm-hmm. in, in Vancouver, Canada. And mm-hmm. you know, mostly he talked about communication and state management and all this other stuff. But on the last day, he kind of went on this path about food, which I thought was pretty interesting. 
And, and then uh, in, the, in the time after that, I started kind of looking into it a little bit because I always thought of myself as like just average, not unhealthy, right. just Right. And, um, and then I decided to do an experiment and I, I, you know, I, I, I cut out a few things and I added a few things and no kidding in 30 days, I dropped 35 pounds, which I was 21 yeah, years amazing. old. I mean, that, that's, that's amazing. That's a big deal. Mm-hmm. And all of my symptoms went away that I was breathing through my sinuses for the first time in, in a decade. My mm-hmm. acne went away. Uh, my digestive problems went away. And of course I didn't need the surgery and yeah. that began my whole journey. And uh, that wasn't enough though. There was one more moment that really kicked the journey underway. And that was, um, my doctor trying to convince me to still have the surgery. So, oh, you know, the doctor's course. office called me and like, well, <laughs> you're feeling better now, but you right, know, right. You, you, the symptoms could come back and you don't want to end up on the waiting list again. And, <laughs> so, right. and I, yes. I, I had this feeling inside, they were like a, a used car salesman trying to, uh-huh. and so I went into the, to the, you know, I went to the doctor's office and I had, I had a checkup and stuff and, and I obviously looked different. I, I was mm-hmm. no longer sick. I was no longer ill in any way. And not once did they ask me how that happened. Mm-hmm. And then I asked my doctor and I said, listen, it was kind of an impetuous question, but I'm like, how long did you go to medical school for six years? And he says, he says, well, uh, I, I said, well, in that six years, how much of that time did you devote to, to nutrition? Mm-hmm. And I got the shock of my life. I mean, these days, I think people know this, but back, we're talking 30 years ago. Like when I, when he told me they didn't study nutrition at all, not even yeah. hours, never mind days or weeks. I yeah, felt like one class. <laughs> I felt like I was on a plane and I just found out the pilot never learned to land the thing. So that was kind of the start of recognizing, hmm, okay, doctors maybe don't have all the expertise in the world and Really, and it really sounds like taking ownership then of your own health as well. Yeah, you know, at that point, I kind of recognized that if if somebody else, if they weren't going to learn to fly the plane, I was going to have to figure it out myself. And and so, yeah, I did. I started doing all kinds of research and and you know reading and and studying whatever I could and and just you know I was just insanely curious about it. And luckily, I had a I had a great I had a job that paid me really well and and you know gave me the resources to to, to, to dive great. into these things in a bigger way. And, um, and then another big thing kind of hit me and it was that, um, as I, as I really narrowed down what I thought was, uh, what I thought were like foundational key nutritional principles, I ha- obviously had a lot of my friends asking me how I did what I did. Cause I right, looked, so, right. I mean, I looked so different that my mom didn't recognize me picking me up at the airport. Like it was, oh, it was seriously? a that completely extreme. different look. Cause remember, mm-hmm. and you know this, I mean, you've, you've seen it with, that I'm mm-hmm. sure many of your clients is like, it's one thing that you lose weight and look different. But the other thing is, is that um, you lose inflammation. Yes. And so you get this like the facial you know, features. And, and yes. I, so I changed so much. My mom couldn't even recognize me. And, and, mm-hmm. um, and so my friends were all asking me like, what did you do? How did you do it? They, you know, they, they were a little like that woman in Harry Met Sally. I'll have what he's having, you know? <laughs> right. right. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I started trying to help people with that. And, mm-hmm. um, and it just didn't work, you know, and, I, and it didn't work not because my nutritional principles were off base. It didn't work because they didn't want it bad enough, you know, or, or yeah. something, you know, I, in particular, one piece. friend of mine lost about 30 some odd pounds over about a month. And he, he was doing mm-hmm. really, really well. Same track as I was on and, and, and mm-hmm. he needed it like he really mm-hmm. needed it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I didn't see him for a while. And the next thing I know, he's put the 30 back on and plus another 10 yeah. and I, you know, and, and he just, he had headed over toward morbid obesity and, and I asked him about it and he's like, well, you know, everything in moderation, you know, all, all, you got to live mm-hmm. all the cliche, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, signs you're headed toward lifestyle disease. And that led me on a different journey. And that was, and I think that, I think in many ways it's been similar to yours is that mm-hmm. I started asking the question of why is it people don't eat what they know they should? And why is it that people yeah. do eat what they know they shouldn't? And, yeah. and so I, I developed, um, let's say a, you know, uh, uh, an offshoot of traditional psychology that you might now call mm-hmm. food psychology mm-hmm. and, and decided to marry those things together to try to create lasting results for people instead of asking them to use willpower. So really getting into, um, more of the behavioral aspect, yeah. uh, I, that's the question that I think I know for my clients, they're always asking and something I was always so curious about of why do we do the things that we don't want to do and don't do the things that we want to do? And, yeah. and how do you intervene with that and actually make the real changes that, that last? Yeah. yeah. So then 
I, I do know another part of your story here where you have spent a lot of time and, and I'll bring this back around to the food stuff too, but with the Hazda tribe, I know a lot of people would love to hear some of those stories, but also how that, did that have an influence then on how you kind of came to create, and we'll talk about Wild Fit, but the whole kind of program that you have. Yeah, yeah it was foundational. So the background okay. is that um, I, I, at that point, had started running a leadership uh, communication seminar, and I'd seen lots of people running seminars, and they use things like, like Tony uses firewalking, and right, some people right. use board breaking, and I wanted a- Yeah, like those uh, ritual things. Yeah, and I wanted a more, I wanted a metaphor that was a lot more like life, you know, like firewalking is mm. a fabulous experience, but that's not life. That's a decision, right. taking action. Um but, but, and so I had climbed Kilimanjaro some years earlier and I realized that <laughs> that might've been the single most powerful personal development thing I'd ever done. Yeah, and so I thought, right? what if I wrapped that in a context? And so I developed a program, a leadership program. And part of that was taking people up Kilimanjaro. So we, we did seven of these uh, expeditions oh, cool. and on one of those expeditions, um, my local logistics partner, I think it was the sec second one. And he, maybe even the first one, I, I have to look back, but he said, Hey, I Googled you. And I saw that you have this interest in anthropology and human history. And of course, my great, my great grandfather had found the oldest homo sapien skull. So oh, I was I, very- I remember listening skull. about that, hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, uh, so he says, well, would you like to go meet some Bushmen? And I'm like, mm -hmm. excuse me, pardon me, what? Like, yeah. I, I knew that they existed and I'd seen the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, which is a oh, must that's watch. That's one of my, my favorite opinion. movies. That was, I'm sorry, I just have to, well, I just have to interject. That was my first movie that on my birthday that I got to take friends to a movie theater and see. That's oh, that's so, so funny. Cool. I've not thought of that movie in years. Yeah. Well, you know, th those are genuine, there's a genuine Khoisan Bushman. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what's amazing about that movie. And, uh, yeah. and so I'd, I'd, I'd known about them and I, and I, you know, I'm from South Africa, so I was aware of the history right. and all this stuff. And, and then he says, well, we've got the Hadzabe people here in East Africa. They're very similar to the Khoisan. Would you like to meet some? And so we go looking for them. And this is 15 years ago. Now there are tour companies that can take yeah, you. Yeah, I know. I know. But, but, you know different not like, though, 15 years ago. Yeah, it was a little different. And so we eventually um, met up with one tribe. And sadly, they had converted in the last 10 years. They'd converted mm -hmm. to uh, alcohol, tobacco, and our agriculture. Oh, wow. and it was, you could see it on them. I mean, none of them were healthy. But then we found our way deeper into Lake Yasi and we stumbled upon our first Hadzabi tribe. And mm -hmm. it was uh, it was stunning. And, and mm -hmm. maybe one of the best ways to describe the impact it had on me is to tell a different story. And that was that okay. one of my guides, Gasper, he's a very good friend of mine. He's a very good man. And um, on our second trip there, he said, he said to me, why do you keep coming back? You know, this is like some people come here one time, the scientists come, they do their study, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the odd, very back then, the very adventurous person might, you know, but nobody comes back, you know, they get their Instagram mm -hmm. picture and that's all they need. Right, right, right. right. Sure. Why are you <laughs> Get all back? the likes. Yeah. <laughs> and I told him that I'm working on this concept called the evolution gap. Mm -hmm. And I told him that I'm working on this idea that, that, you know, to a large degree, um, people living out, out in the, what we might call developed world are suffering from some, some sort of like nature deprivation syndrome. Yeah. And so that there are things we could learn from the Hadzabe people, like look at the way they eat, they exercise. And he mm -hmm. says, so you think that if we ate more like they ate, we'd be healthier. And I go, well, that's an mm -hmm. oversimplification, but sure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was the end of that. For the next couple of years, he pesters me to go visit this school that he's building. And I, I will tell you something, when you climb Kilimanjaro, yeah. every porter, Every guide has a school, a library, or an sure. orphanage because they have figured out the language to get better tips. I, sure. I'm not of saying course. some of them don't have a school. Most of them don't. <laughs> yeah. And so Gasper keeps doing this. And I'm like, oh, Gasper, we have such a friendship and such a, you know, uh, there's a lot of trust between us. Why, you know, why do you need to, this manipulation? Mm -hmm. I, I give you the tips. We don't need it. And then we're doing one trip and we have this long itinerary. And I noticed there's like a four hour gap in one of the days. And I don't understand it. I go, Gasper. What's with this four hour gap? And he goes, no kidding. He goes, he goes like, oh my, there is a gap there. I guess we could stop off at my school. <laughs> so of course we go to his school. You know, he finally it's wins, great. right? Right, well, yeah. I got to his school. Now, before I say what happened there, I've been to many schools in Tanzania because we've often taken gifts and taken money and donations. Sure. And, and I can tell you that at every school I've been to, particularly government schools, 
the children there are not healthy. They, they yeah. live almost 100% on ugali, which, you know, is either corn or, or maize meal. There's no fruit yeah. and vegetables. There's no meat. They, they, their little bellies are distended. Their eyes are watering. Their runny nose. They're, they're, they're not healthy. Mm -hmm. I got to gas for school and the kids were unbelievable. They, they had really? muscles and they were fast really? and they were strong and their eyes were sharp and they yeah. were lean in a good, healthy way. And I turned to him and I go, why are your kids so different than the others? Mm -hmm. And he goes, you don't remember? I go, remember what? And he goes, five mm -hmm. years ago, you and I sat around the fire and you told me that if we close the gap between us and the Hadzabe people, if we combine the best of civilization and the best of the Hadzabe, and so these children get meat twice a week, oh, we get fruits and vegetables, goosebumps. that's why they look like this. That is what I'm trying wow. to do for the rest of the world. Yeah, I love it. And you are on the mission. It's a great mission. So when you had those experiences um, and you kind of had that idea rolling about the evolution gap, is that something then that have you been able to take that back and apply to your real life? Is that where wild fit came in? How did that all work? Yeah, it, it really did. I mean, um, the, the, the evolution gap is a much bigger conversation than it is about food. Um, food is yeah. just one chapter. So let me define properly That'd the evolution great. gap. The evolution gap is a gap that I suggest exists between our, our biological uh, genetic evolution and our capacity for innovation, technological yeah. and social innovation. And so the way evolution, natural selection typically works is that it works in lockstep with the response of your environment. So if you're a cheetah and you're living in the savanna, and then there's, um, let's say the polar caps are melting and there's more water coming into Africa and now the savanna turns into bushland, then what happens is, is that a new set of genes get adopted and the cheetahs end up with big splotchy black marks on yeah, them instead right. of little dots. Then when the savanna turns back into a grassland, the cheetah slowly, but this, this, this happens mm. over tens of thousands of years. Yeah. Um, if the gazelle is a tiny little bit faster this week than the cheetah, they a tiny incremental adjustment. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden there came this moment where we started um, lifting ourselves away from the natural selection conversation. We started lifting ourselves away from the selective pressures of, of nature. We, we developed tools uh, and, and, you know, like you can imagine that, the first time somebody imagined that they could throw a rock at something they were hunting. That's a big, right, that's a big right. upgrade. I mean, if you were, mm -hmm. if you were in the, you know, up in the mountains in Canada and you, and you saw a grizzly pick up a rock and throw it at a moose, you'd be pretty impressed. It's a big yeah, jump. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and, and then there's the next jump of sharpening those rocks. And then there's the jump of, well, what if we used a long stick and sharpen it and we put some kind of poison on it? Wait a minute. What about a bow and arrow? I'm pretty convinced right. it took some psychedelics to figure that one out. But, but the point <laughs> is, that, yeah. but you can see that each of these technological changes would have changed their relationship with nature and yeah. it would have changed it faster than our genetic, uh, our ability to genetically evolve alongside that. That's where the gap is. And I would suggest that almost all of the pain and suffering that we have at an individual, social, and even global level owes itself to that gap. And, and here's a great example of it. Um, we evolved uh, a heart and we evolved mm -hmm. a heart as a mechanism for pumping oxygen around our body because we need, we need that. We need it urgently. We need it every right. minute. We need it all the time. So the heart is always there. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And, and equally, we evolved a diaphragm. The diaphragm is called pulling the air in and, you know, it's, 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 it's a pump. We need to have it. Our mm -hmm. lymphatic system, we need to have that. We need right. to have lymphatic flow to cleanse all of the cells inside our body. But for some reason, God or Darwin forgot to give it a pump. There's no pump. Right. People sitting around at their desk, mm -hmm. in their car, watching Netflix, and they're not moving their, their, their lymph at all because there's no pump. This right. seems like a flaw, but it isn't a flaw because our ancestors were required to walk 10 or 20 miles a day, every single day, and to lift and to dig and to climb. So what they did was they regularly contracted and relaxed muscles constantly, which is the pump. You sure. are the pump for your lymphatic right, right. system, but our modern lifestyle is where the evolution gap opens up and exposes a major problem. And that is that the average person walking around today, the average person living today is not cleansing efficiently from the inside. Yeah. Beautiful example of that. I think too about, you know, back when, you know, right now I'm just thinking about, about diabetes and where that's all going, but how back in the day, you know, there would have been some benefit to be able to, 
have that higher blood sugar. You know what? It, I mean, it would have been some survival. You're dead on. You're dead on. I mean, I, I see the constant glucose monitor trend. Yeah. yeah. And I want to be clear. I'm not saying they're without utility, but I'm saying that for most people, they're using them incorrectly in my very humble opinion. Sure, I, sure. I, you know, I, you're free to do what you want. But what I keep hearing from friends of mine that are using them is it's like, oh, I noticed that if I eat this, I get this big glycemic spike. But if I eat this, I don't. As if a glycemic spike is a bad thing. Right. And my view of that is, is that if you and I were 20,000 years ago walking through sub-Saharan Africa and we stumbled upon a, a, a bush full of fruit, guess what we're about to have? Yeah, A glycemic exactly. spike. Exactly. And we're meant to yeah. have it. The problem yeah, yeah. isn't the individual glycemic spike. The problem is the consistent consumption of carbohydrates yeah. without any seasonal constraint. That's right. where the real problem comes in. And you're absolutely right. Diabetes sits firmly in the evolution gap. And, and, yeah. and it basically works like this. We evolved three core metabolic modes that are designed to get us through each of the seasons and to mm -hmm. utilize those seasons. So, you know, I, I, we, 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 the minute there's carbohydrate food availability, we enter into the medic, metabolic mode of autumn and, and right. there's carbohydrate foods. And here's what happens. And everybody recognizes this pattern. I eat some carbs, so I crave more carbs. Yes, right. because that was a survival strategy. <laughs> Like right. it's, yeah, it was yeah. like a super important survival strategy. Well, then, I love that. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. No, you oh, go. It's just, you know, then you start to store a little bit of glycogen and a little bit of fat. Again, yeah. you have to, because what's coming yes. after autumn, you know, you, it's winter. And yeah. so, you know, then you move into winter and you move to another metabolic mode and then you move to spring and you move to another metabolic mode. But the average person never leaves the, the metabolic mode of autumn. fall and <laughs> yeah. they're not even eating good quality carbs in fall. They're, so they're in right. something you might call junk fall. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Yes, yeah. I like that whole idea of the 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 different seasons of eating. And so do you relate that to the actual seasons that we experience? Because I'm thinking, no. you know, yeah, because I was going to say we're all in different seasons. I mean, yeah. wherever we live or yeah. So yeah, you're talking that, you know, like metaphorically funny. in a way. I, 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 I do, I speak about this often and I've been speaking about it for over 10 years and, and, mm -hmm. and then people hear a, a snippet on a social channel and then they go and tell their clients, some influencer, I, I see them, they go, oh, you got to eat seasonally mm -hmm. where, you know, no, oh, sure. if, if you live in, in the Arctic circle, that's a very yeah. different seasonal, you know, situation than if you live in Minnetonka versus Costa Rica, you know, whatever. Right, right. So what we're really on about here is that humans, we, we spent like say 99.99% of our history in sub-Saharan Africa. So mm -hmm. our systems, our, 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 our metabolic modes evolved to cope with that, with those seasons. Sure. And so, you know, so the idea here is, is not to think so much about what season you're in. The idea here is to think what result you want and then understand yeah. that you can stimulate the metabolic mode that you evolved and you can stimulate that mode to get the result you want. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So I also like the message that you give um, because it's a little bit where people are at right now. I mean, we really are in a health crisis and, and where a lot of people are at this idea of because of this evolution gap, it takes some of the, um, I'm not saying response. I believe everybody has a responsibility to their own health, but maybe some of the blame. Uh, I mean, I, I work with lots of clients where I mean, I see firsthand, I'm in deep relationship with them. I see firsthand the struggle of someone who is overweight and how hard they try. And yeah. even, you know, doing so many of the right things, you know, all these things, but just can't get it off. And, and to me, there's so many environmental triggers. Um, we have a whole industries around that. I like the message of you know, this is kind of hardwired within us to seek out sugar to, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I, I yeah, would go. say this, um, if you, and if you ever, if you or anybody that's listening, if you're, if you're overweight or you have type two diabetes or you have a lifestyle disease, let me, let me, hmm. let me just say something really cleanly. I, I, let me, it's not your fault. Yeah. It is in no way your fault but it is completely and only your responsibility to do something about it now. Yeah. That's the harsh yeah. thing. Now, the reason yeah. it's not your fault is that first of all, as you've just rightly pointed out, we are living with an evolutionary mismatch. So we're living in an environment that's different than our genes. So that makes it difficult already. Mm -hmm. But worse yeah. than that, the food industry has hijacked our instincts and hijacked our emotional states for their profit. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, as a very good example, you, 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 you're, you're with a sports team, you know, a high school sports team, and they went to go play in the championship and they lost. Now you're all in the bus and you're headed home, you know, from the game and everybody's sad. Some people might even be crying and, mm-hmm. and you're sitting there, you're the coach, you feel bad. And, and all you want to do because you're a loving, nurturing, caring human being is make everybody in the, in the, in the, in the bus feel better. And you've already tried telling them, it doesn't matter if we win or lose. It's how we played. And you guys were right. amazing and you've done all the right things, but you, you can't get there. And so you're like, yeah. we're going to pull in for pizza. We're yeah. going to pull in for pizza, Cokes and ice cream. And so they pull in. And of course that does lift their mood. First, the decision to do it. Okay, guys, let's go get some beer or, you know, beer, maybe not beer, but let's go get some, you know, <laughs> you know some pizza and, and Cokes right. and stuff. And the minute you announce that everybody starts producing serotonin and dopamine. Yes. And then you walk in there and you eat this high calorie load. And remember the body doesn't, the body just thinks calories are wonderful. No matter which ones you put in the body's like, yeah. Oh, calories. So more serotonin yes. and more dopamine. And what's happened in that moment is that pizza hut or whoever it is, has now successfully hijacked those children's emotional states. And so for the rest of their lives, because this was a very peak moment, they're going to have a bad day at the office one day. And they're going to have this, like, this is the day to pull in and get pizza. And and the food industry has been playing this game and then also manipulating our food guidelines, you know, telling us that, oh, you don't have to cut your calories. You just have to bicycle them away. Right. Uh You just have to move more, move more. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been deeply manipulated by the food industry in order to boost their profitability. And so and, and then, by the way, I'm, I, I'm gonna, this is where I probably should put my tinfoil hat on to say this next part, because it's going to sound conspiracy, conspiracy theory-like. But listen, in the 1970s, true. the tobacco industry started to recognize that they had a major problem. And that problem was that people were getting very, very sick from their products and dying. And that likely individual lawsuits and class action lawsuits were going to happen. And they knew that. Yeah. Now, when, when, as a large, you know, multi-million billion dollar corporation, if you start thinking about the damage of an individual suit like that, this is a major threat to your business. You're talking about yes. settlements that were in the 10, 20, 30, even hundred yeah. million dollar range. So they didn't want that. There are two ways to manipulate a jury. The one is against the law. And that's mm-hmm. where you find out where the jury, you know, who they are and you go and bribe right, them or them. extort them. That's generally frowned upon. <laughs> right? Just a little bit. Yes. But the second way <laughs> is to tamper with the entire population so that the jury is seated with your sympathy. What did they do? They started calling lung cancer a lifestyle disease. And by calling it a lifestyle Mm -hmm. disease, now you end up on the jury and they Mm -hmm. hammer that point the whole time. Look, of course our product is dangerous, but you gotta be a bit stupid to suck this stuff into your lungs anyway. This is a lifestyle disease. They were shifting after telling us that three out of four doctors recommend smoking cigarettes, after telling us right. that you've come a long way, baby, and as a woman, right, you need right. to start smoking. After all the manipulation, they then shifted the blame back to the consumer and they invented the idea of lifestyle disease. And by the way, they own most mm-hmm. of the food companies now. I, I, and yes. so we're in this mm-hmm. place where if you're, if you're dealing with a lifestyle disease, you've been conditioned that it's your fault. It is not. But at yeah. the same time, you're, you're the only one who can dig yourself out. Yep, Exactly. How do you have thoughts on how we do kind of reconcile ourselves, you know, um, genetically with where we are currently at in the environment and the food culture and all of that? You know, genetics are really, are really fascinating. And, and of course, um, marketing is also fascinating. And so mm-hmm. um, marketing, the tighter the niche market you can market to, the more that individual niche market will respond to your message. So Let's say, for example, you go in, you're, you have a new dog and you're going to train mm-hmm. it and you go into the bookstore and you see a, do- a, a book that says Dog Training 101. Oh, I think I'll buy that. But then you walk around the corner and there's a whole case and there's dog training for Dalmatians and dog training mm-hmm. for Huskies. You're going to buy the one for your species. Now, this right. an author actually did this. And I can mm-hmm. tell you that the book was 99% the same book, but one little <laughs> chapter different. about that yeah. species. Like if you're going right. to get a Husky, you need to know right now. <laughs> Don't take it off the leash. They run away, right? They, little, yeah. little distinctions, right? So marketing really works that way. So one of the smartest things you can do if you want to market to people is find out like, if, like it's like when you're in the airport, you hear the announcements, the, the announcements are like this. <laughs> Would Heather come to this? <laughs> you right. hear your name in a heartbeat, right? Right, right. Well, so marketers understand that. And so what we want to do is go eat right for your blood type. No, I'm sorry, but no, Uh, you can take any American on the standard Mm -hmm. American diet and put them on any of the four blood type diets and their health will improve. 
Right. And, and yes. so now the next version is get your genome tested and then we'll uh-huh. tell you your perfect yeah. diet. Let me tell you something. Like, this is so fascinating. They just discovered a new anaconda in South America. Mm-hmm. And it's the largest, it's the largest snake in the world. And it's not that they've never Nightmares. found this big snake before. It's that they knew that there was a green anaconda, but now they realize that they, there's a species differentiating between the northern and southern green anacondas, and that one mm-hmm. of them is significantly bigger on average than the other. Mm-hmm. So what makes a species differentiation? Well, they have about a 5% genetic difference between the two, right? Okay. They okay. eat exactly the same thing. They have the right. same diet. They live in the same basic environment, right. just north and south. And they eat almost, they have a 5% genetic uh, difference. Do you know what our genetic difference from chimpanzees is? 2%. Mm -hmm. So we are more closely related to chimpanzees than the green, the Northern green anaconda is to the Southern green anaconda. And I would argue that we could probably do the same evaluation of the white rhino and the black rhino. The reason I say this is that you can go get your genome tested and what it might do. and, And I would stretch at this is talk to you a little bit about food sensitivity you mm-hmm. might not be lactose intolerant. That doesn't mean that, you know, bovine milk is a good idea. Right. It just means right. you don't have that. Or you might be a little more gluten intolerant because you didn't come from the, 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 the grain crescent. And so you don't have a few hundred or a few thousand years. It doesn't mean it's good for you. So yeah. the genetic side, I would say this, that homo sapiens are homo sapiens. And we all require the same 13 vitamins, the same 16 minerals, the same Mm -hmm. nine amino acids and the same fatty acids and the same water. We have all basically the same requirements. Then there are little lifestyle adjustments. I would say that men and women are different. As Mm -hmm. an example, men really don't respond well to veganism after about 18 months. If they're not supplementing, it shows up. Listen, if you want to be a vegan, we, we have programs. Oh, no, I'd vegans. love to. Go, I'd love to go down this road. But yeah, go ahead. We, we, we support <laughs> vegans and we do the best do we you? can. And, mm-hmm. and we should talk. But women, they can last much yeah. longer. Well, there's, yeah. there's evolutionary reasons for this. If you're very athletic, then you're going to have a different metabolic speed. But that doesn't change your vitamins and minerals requirement. It just requ- right. changes maybe the quantity. So right. Our version of this is that there is a fundamental core human diet and that to the degree that you stick to that diet, you will have the, the, the best health experience and the best recovery mm-hmm. from injury and disease. And the degree to you, toward you wear off, you know, go off that diet is the degree mm-hmm. to which you're going to suffer and you're going to have a horrible and maybe early end of life process. Yeah. So this would then move into the wild fit program that we haven't talked about specifically, but this is sort of the coaching program that you, and this has been, you've had this for a while. I mean, wild fit's been going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that it has reached many, many people. Um, but in it then, so what I hear you saying is there's sort of this, this, um, maybe core diet that as humans, everyone in general could kind of follow, feel better, um, help in some of the, the life, the lifestyle illnesses that we have going on with, within the wild fit program then is that where you kind of add in all the behavioral change stuff yes. as well? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. let's go back to my friend that I tried to help. It didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Then I, uh, I, I got this phone call from Tony Robbins company one day and they said, could you come and teach business at our business mastery program? I, I at first I thought it was a practical joke cause I wasn't even, Oh, speaking, this is awesome. But, yeah. But I went, I flew off to Fiji <laughs> yeah, and I, sure. I got to you meet and, yes. and Tony was amazing. He was so good to me Aww, in every possible cool. way. And then he booked me for a year of events to speak at. Oh, that's amazing. And I was so inspired by that, that afterward I got into teaching business, mostly in Northern Europe. It just, it happens to be where the mm-hmm. demand was. And, but my clients kept asking me like, you, you never do jet lag. And cause I could arrive in a city and start teaching the next morning and I was fine. And, oh, and I'm on yeah. stage sometimes 10, 12 hours and, and I, I don't run out of energy and they don't see me snacking on garbage. As a matter of fact, sometimes right. I'm even fasting while I do that. So they're all blown away and they're going, how do you do that? So I started sharing, reluctantly sharing my core nutritional principles with people. And then guess what? Mm -hmm. I'd go back six months later and I'd see that they hadn't applied them. And it just, I was like, it it made me like, I don't even want to do this. And I'm not writing a diet book. The world does not need another diet book, you know? (laughs) And and the average person, by the way, there's a big Mm -hmm. study done published in the the United Kingdom. There was a, uh, Mm -hmm. the average person will undertake two diets a year throughout their life. And they will stick to each one for about six or seven days. So I was not interested in that. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work. Exactly. And so 
one day I took a look at um, the way we did our business programs and we found out something really stunning about our business program is that we had like an 80 to 90% completion rate on a 90 day mm -hmm. coaching program. And that's very unusual. That's amazing. Very mm -hmm. unusual. I mean, yeah. the industry average is three to 6%. So, you know, so yeah, I thought, wait huge. a second now, I know why that program is sticky because it uses something called behavioral change dynamics that mm -hmm. I developed. It's a system of, um, designing, ex it, 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 it's, it's basically user experience. It's how do you design mm -hmm. a retreat, a seminar, a video program that is sticky and transformative. And right. so I, I then went away and I thought, well, what if I, what if I just create that same structure, but for nutrition? And so yeah. I, I, I went to my team and I said, I'm going to do this. And they go, Eric, you're a business teacher. You have no business. You're like, don't, what In are you doing? Space. And I said, I know, but I just feel really called to do it. I see these people mm -hmm. and they're suffering. And by the way, they were in much better health than the average American at that stage. But I could see yeah. the American food stuff coming across. Like I lived in England for 10 years and I oh, watched sure. everybody gain 30 pounds while I was there. It was just, it was sure. crazy. Yeah, yeah. And so I, um, I went to my team. My team was reluctant, but in the end they supported me. And, and I, I announced the program and took eight people through it. Mm -hmm. And all eight of them got really, really interesting transformations. And so I did it for another eight people and then another eight people. And each time I was making little adjustments, then I got tired of saying the same things at every coaching session. So I went into the studio and I recorded the first version of Wild Fit so that mm -hmm. the clients, so I wouldn't have to keep repeating myself. And so that the time right. I spent with the clients was on their customizations, on their yeah, coaching and awesome. accountability. And then it just, it was it was just working really, really well. Then one of my clients said, can I tell my network about your program? We didn't even have a website. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the only way you could buy it <laughs> was funny. if you were one of my business programs and you if know, you we were, were selling maybe yeah. and give them a year. It was sure, a good sure. business. Yeah. And then this one friend of mine said, you better put up a website. I'm about to tell my network. And then 200 people signed up in about three oh. days. And then about oh, wow. three weeks later, another 200 people signed up. And then Vishen Lakiani from Mind Valley yep. did Wild yep. Fit. And he told his network and 1100 people signed up in a week. And all of a wow. sudden we, we realized that I, you know, my reluctance was wrong. And that we needed yeah. to get this message out into the world and that there was a way to do it that was going to be, that would be uh, um, self-funding that we could, that, that it could, that it could, that we'd actually be able to reinvest in the business. And, um, and, and, and so today, you know, we're, what are we, we're, we're I think a hundred thousand clients in, yeah. in, in a hundred countries around the world. The Canadian government gave me a lit on the Senate floor, gave me a medal for the work that oh we're doing, goodness. improving the quality oh, of that's lives. So cool. And it's been a real, yeah. it's been a real honor journey. Your, your idea of, um, that program, I've heard you say this, that that program is not necessarily a weight loss based program. No. Although you, I know you get great results with it's, it weight loss through it. It's mm -hmm. probably, and, and, and by the way, we are like, we're about a week away from starting clinical trials on, on diabetes, but of oh. course we're going to get all the weight oh. loss stats from that as well. I, sure. I would argue, and, and, and I'd love for anybody to stand up and challenge me so that we could compare, mm -hmm. but I would argue that it is the single best uh, weight loss program ever designed. But yeah. it was never designed for that. It was designed right. for correcting your relationship with food. And as That's it turns out, if you are well nourished and you run proper metabolic balance, then what happens is your body gains weight where it needs it and it loses weight where it doesn't. And so you right size. That relationship with food part within and, and you know, you don't need to give details of the program or anything, but just. Where, where do you, um, I guess, where did you get this idea of relationship with food and you know, are you specifically targeting then the behaviors around food or are you diving more into the deeper psychology of it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, there are a couple, there, there's many facets to that. So for example, the one thing we have to do is um, uncouple and deframe the food industry hypnosis. Yeah. Right? So, so we do a lot of work on that. So people can see cool. between the lines. It's almost like once you've seen the matrix, you know, it's like, yeah, you so can't I, unsee it. Yeah. And, and so we, we, the first bit is to get, our, you know, basically to get our clients to understand the world they're living in. And, and, and I'll tell you one of the reasons it's an emotional thing. If I ask you to give up sugar, say, and by the way, mm -hmm. we would never ask our clients to give anything up permanently. We, we are all about freedom. We just give them yeah, guidelines on things yep. to experiment with. Mm -hmm. And so let's say I ask you to give up sugar, you know, for a week and, 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 and now you go to the grocery store and you pick up your, your, your favorite jar of ragu tomato sauce or whatever it is that you, mm -hmm. you know, you like to eat. And so you look at it and then you see that sugar is the number two ingredient. Yeah. Before I work with you, then you're likely to look at that. And, and I'm sure you're already way past this, but the average person, they look at the yeah. ingredient and they see sugar and they're disappointed. 
Right. They're disappointed and frustrated because I wanted to buy this and it's my favorite. And now mm -hmm. I have lack. Mm -hmm. Now I have deprivation. Now I feel controlled yep. and their inner rebel is going to kick in and they're going to eat it. Oh. Once they begin to understand that it is actually appropriate to add a little bit of sugar to tomato sauce because you want to mm -hmm. counterbalance the acidity in the tomatoes. And there's a whole other conversation about that, mm -hmm. but it is absolutely not necessary for it to be the number two ingredient on that label. Exactly. And the right. reason that it's there is that sugar stimulates your appetite. They are trying to make you hungry so that you buy more. Once right. you know that, now you go into the grocery store, you see sugar and you're not disappointed. You're pissed off. Right. Anger. And if you get angry, <laughs> then now you rebel against them instead right. of the rules. So yeah. it's a subtle shift, but it changes oh, it's huge. so much. So we do a lot of work around that, the food industry, you know, decoupling people from the food industry. Mm -hmm. Then the next bit we, we, we dive, dive into is, the, is, is really truly understanding your emotional states. And here, here's a, I'll give you, I mean, you, I'll give you one of the most powerful food principles that that exists. And, it, and it's part of the evolutionary mismatch we're living in. A couple of weeks ago, um, we're, we're rescuing a rainbow boa constrictor snake here in the, in the Dominican Republic. So we're walking through the forest and it's quite a long hike. And as we get mm -hmm. to this one section of the forest, there are some cacao trees in that area and they happen to have some ripe cacao fruit on them. So we're breaking the cacao open and we're eating the cacao fruit. And, and mm -hmm. for those of you who don't cool. know cacao fruit, it's the plant that they make chocolate from, but we're not eating the seed. We're eating the flesh around the seed. They don't use the that pulp. for the chocolate. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're eating these and they're so delicious. They're so delicious. What are we getting? We're getting serotonin and dopamine. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because the body is rewarding you for doing something good, right? right? Because in nature, every calorie you can find is a good calorie for more sure, or less. So, sure. But the other reason for the serotonin and the dopamine is that emotion is the glue that causes your memory to stick and locks your yes. geographic memory. So yes. now you produce all the serotonin and dopamine and your body goes, I will remember this place. Yes. Right? Because yes. It, if you can remember that place, it means next year your chances of survival are better. No kidding. Right. About four hours later, we've released the snake in the wilderness. We're mm -hmm. walking back from the waterfall and, and we're walking along. And my then six year old daughter, we walk mm -hmm. just, we're just basically approaching that section of the forest. It looks like any other section of the forest. She goes, we're in the cacao forest instantly. Her paleolithic brain was remembering where the fruit trees were. It was supposed yeah. to be that way. And when, when we begin to understand that that's, the, that that's the way the emotions work, then the next bit of it is, is that now you understand why McDonald's put a, a jungle, uh, like a playground in their parks, because yeah. the kids go there and they f have all this dopamine and serotonin totally. dopamine, and they anchor the smell the smell, which is a bottled thing, right? They, they mm -hmm. anchor the smell and the golden arches yes. with all these feel good chemicals. And that's why now they're 38 years old and they had a shitty day at work and they pull into the drive through and they don't even know why they're doing it. So again, yep. now there's the emotional side and then how the food industry is taking advantage of that. But there's one more that's even more stunning. And it's this, when you do something amazing, you know, I'm, I'm a big, I like James Clear's book, uh, Atomic Habits, mm -hmm. fabulous. And love that book. Yeah, love him. Yeah. And then I see all these people debating, is it 61 days to create a habit? Is it 21 oh, right. days to create a habit and all this kind of stuff? Let me dispel that whole thing for you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take any number of days to create a habit. It takes a certain amount of emotional engagement. So love that. as an example, let's imagine you love have a rookie that. playing in, in the World Series, baseball, say. And he's mm -hmm. not really expecting to play. It's the World Series, but somebody gets injured. And in the final game, the bases are, are loaded, but they're two points behind, whatever, right? And he gets mm -hmm. asked to go up to bat in an emergency. He hits the ball, hits it out, home run, wins the World Series. <laughs> does he celebrate? He absolutely does. Does the team celebrate him? Absolutely. Does the city mm -hmm. celebrate him? Yes. And he's getting goosebumps all over his body and he's feeling <laughs> amazing. And his brain instantly goes, how did I do this? because that's a survival mechanism for how did I find this honey? How sure. did I kill this mammoth? Your, the brain goes, how did I do this? And, and it's like, it, it goes back and looks at say the last 24 hours of your behavior and it's looking for things that you did that might've led to this magic. So yeah. his brain looks back. Oh, look, I was in the locker room. I tied my left shoe first. Yep. I tied my right shoe second, but I did bang my head on the locker in between them. That mm -hmm. kid is going to tie his left shoe first yep. for the rest of his career. And he's going to bang his head on the locker for good luck. He did not need 21 days to create that habit. He needed intense emotional experience. Oh, that's and a so huge point. We do this badly. We have yeah. a horrible day at work. 
and we come home and have wine or yeah. ice cream or chocolate. And then the body goes, oh my God, look at all these calories. How did I manifest this? Yeah. Oh, look, I had a shitty day at work and I got angry at somebody in traffic. From now onwards, if we want lots of calories, all we have to do is trick this body into being depressed or sad or angry. And so the, the, the life hack, the life-changing life hack is if you want to eat something, say, that you think of as naughty, you want to eat a high mm -hmm. calorie, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. only ever do that to reward behaviors that you want to repeat. Keeps you in that cycle of being able to create those sustainable, those lasting changes. That, yeah. 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 And yeah, your body will take sure. a look and go, wow, I'm eating a bowl of ice cream right now. What did I, and look, I don't, I wouldn't eat a bowl of ice cream, but look, no, I, I get we're it. here yeah, about yeah. freedom. And, and the body goes, oh, I'm getting all this fat and I'm getting all this sugar. That's a good thing. Remember the body doesn't know. And, exactly. and then it goes, what did I do to create this? And it looks back and it goes, oh, I'm a sales guy. And I made 58 phone calls today instead of only 28. Right. And so then, then, then the body starts to unconsciously go on days that we do 58 uh, uh, phone calls, good things happen. I think too, just that education piece on how our whole nervous system, our brain and body respond so unconsciously, yeah. but bringing that into the consciousness and just educating can be so incredibly helpful yeah. um, for anyone wanting to make change around food. There is a piece of, uh, I really hesitate to use the word addiction process, but there is, you know, I think I've been thinking about that a lot, like where that is with food and creating those cycles within our brain and body and nervous system and, and um, emotion is always at the heart of all yeah. of those things for sure. Yeah, very much. Okay. So let me ask you maybe a little controversial. We touched on it a little bit ago, but you brought up the word vegetarian or veganism or something. Just, I'm really just curious, where are you at with that? Um, I'm not sure if Wild Fit in particular um, talks about that. You said, you know, it can be doable, but thoughts on, I mean, it's such a controversy right now. So I just wanted to bring it up. So in our Wild Fit community, we have many vegetarians and vegans. In fact, I okay. was stunned one day to find a Facebook group called Wild Fit for Vegans or something. And it had oh, like 2000 yeah. people in it or something. And oh. I, I didn't, I didn't understand that, but mm -hmm. um our view is this, um, we want to support people in having a healthy, functional relationship with food. And we, 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 the gift we give people is what we call food freedom, which is the ability to never eat things that you regret and never miss out. It's to eat what yeah, you want when that. you want as much as you want and feel good about it. And yeah. the only way you can do that is if you have a functional relationship with food. Now, some of our clients come in and they don't want to eat animal products and, and, you know, and they have three primary reasons for not wanting to do that the environment sure. perceptions about health and, uh, and animal rights. And, 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 you know, we can discuss those things. Um, we are not advocating for veganism. We will never take somebody who is eating animal products and recommend that they go to veganism. We don't regard sure. it as an optimal lifestyle. We regard it as a choice that you've made that we will then do what we can to support you in maintaining, but we will support you in maintaining it by supplementing because there's no question you're going to need that. Yeah, or right. we will support you in trying to help you break your ideology about it. Now, mm -hmm. you know, there are different types of vegans. There are ideological vegans, and then there are sort of socially conscious vegans. And then there are misguided mm -hmm. vegans. And they, you know, there's a bunch of different mm -hmm. ones. The ideological ones are the problem. And what I mean by that is that once you become ideological about something, it means that you're willing to sacrifice your health for your ideology. And that's where right. you've seen these horrible things on social media, where you see these vegans, like you watch their pictures over the space of six, seven years, yeah. and they waste away. Because yeah. once they became ideological, guess what? They can't go supplement B12. They can't go supplement iron because that would be proof Against, that their ideology right. is broken. Yeah. So what we try and do is say, look, we're, we're going to recommend to you on this program that you, that you, that you relabel yourself as a flexitarian and not necessarily mm -hmm. a vegetarian or not mm -hmm. necessarily a vegan. And that might mean that at certain stages of the program, if you experience hunger, because people should never feel hungry when they're on our program yeah. ever. Yeah. And so yeah. if you feel a little hunger, it's harder when you're a vegan. I mean, think about this, how often, and by the way, I'm not a fan of full carnivorism either, by the way. Yeah, me, um, me either. So, yeah. yeah. We'll come back to that. But, but okay. let's just compare how often does a lion eat and how often does an elephant eat? Well, mm -hmm. a lion eats once a day, once every two or three days. That's it. Right. How often does an elephant eat? 23 hours of the day. Mm -hmm. That's how inefficient Constant, mass yeah. is. 
You know, it, right. they, they, they are basically all an elephant really is, is a grass, a grass redistribution machine. It just, it goes and eats grass and bark and, and redistributes yep. it. Now in our world, if you're, if you're going to be vegan, you're going to be doing a lot of eating a lot, yeah. like way, way right. and consistently. And you're also still going to be missing core things. So we, mm -hmm. we support them going both ways. What I would say is that if you think of the spectrum of herbivorism, you know, veganism, yeah. but in nature, it's called being herbivore. Yeah. And then you go all the way over to a carnivore and you think of it as a mm -hmm. spectrum. And it really is a spectrum because here's an example. If you're an mm -hmm. elephant, you eat about 200 kilograms, which is say, what is that? 450 pounds of right. grass, bark, and seasonal fruits every day. Yeah, every it's amazing. Day. And you amazing. drink about 70 liters of water. I don't know what that means in gallons, but a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. now here's something most people haven't thought about. How many grubs, how many grubs and insects and larvae are in 450 pounds of mm. bark and, and grass? Right, right. And when they suck up all the water, how many tadpoles and fish eggs? And sure. Like, so you got to figure that out okay. of, say, 450 pounds, they're probably yeah. eating half a pound of insect material every day. So right. then you have to do this next thought experiment, which is impossible to do, but let's do it anyway. I, in fact, I think it's being done to some degree. But let's imagine that we could like veganize their food. It's, it's mm -hmm. awful that they eat the insects. So we go clean all the insects off their food. Mm -hmm. And so they could be eating their proper herbivore diet. What would right. likely happen to those elephants? Bad, terrible things. Because uh -huh. they likely have a level of nutritional dependence on those insects, even though they don't specifically aim to target for them. So if, right. we, if we remove them, and, 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 and here's a shocking truth about elephants and basically animals that live in captivity is captivity is bad. I mean, if you're a goldfish, mm -hmm. you can pull it off, but the rest of animals don't like it. It's so true that elephants working in slave conditions in mm -hmm. forestry uh, areas in Thailand live longer than zoo mm -hmm. elephants. They live Sorry. longer than zoo elephants. Like it's, it's a shocking truth, right? And, and, and so, and I would suggest one of the reasons is zoo elephants are eating hay and they're eating, and they're not right. getting their food. So, right, right, right. So if you look at that spectrum, I would say at one end you have veganism, at the other end you have carnivorism. I can tell you right now, if you told me I had to go live on a desert island for the rest of my life and I had to pick mm -hmm. one extreme or the other, I'll yeah. take carnivorism all day long. Yeah. Yeah. That said, we know for certain, I saw this Instagram reel the other day and this guy says, the guy says, well, the interviewer says, well, there are those people who say that we are traditionally hunter gatherers and so we ate both meat. And the guy goes, uh -huh. That's, uh, that assumes facts that aren't in evidence, humans, blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. like, dude knows nothing. Like, I, right, I, I, right. who domesticated potatoes and tomatoes and squash and I cacao know. for that matter? People, like we, no. we've clearly had a relation, a seasonal relationship with plants. And so I, 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 my view of that is, is that we are supposed to not have a plant-based diet. We're supposed to be more mm -hmm. having like a meat-based diet or an animal product-based diet that is supplemented by seasonally available fruits and vegetables from time to time. Yeah, I love that. Very clear cut, also very inclusive. And um, I think, uh, well, dare we say moderation. I'm not sure where that word is these days, but you know, yeah, so that's great. What about like on a practical level? three basic changes maybe you'd give to someone who's really trying to maybe like biggest bang for their buck. They're, they're really trying to change their health. You know, they're really trying to make some significant changes. Um, okay. So the, the, the first thing I would say is this, that um, I want to share one principle and then the three things. Yeah, go ahead. The principle is, and, and it's a principle that you, you certainly can live by and, and, and it can help a great deal because What's going on right now is that the food industry um, is confusing us because they are, do you remember the game risk? Mm -hmm. So the food industry is basically playing a game of risk with our plate. They're, they're, mm -hmm. the, the meat people are trying to get their share and the grain people are trying to get right. their share and the dairy people are trying to get their, in Canada, they've pushed the dairy people off into a little side, little, they, they've pushed mm -hmm. them away. They're like, not necessary. You can sit over there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but they're all, they're all playing with this, right? So what that means is that one day bread is good for you. And the next minute bre bread is bad. Wine is good. Wine is bad. Eggs are good. Eggs right. are bad. Meat is good. Meat is bad, you know, and on. So yeah. what we want to do is, is there's one principle that can clean all of that up for us. And the principle works like this. Any food principle, any food idea, any study that you read about, any fad that violates what we know about human history and evolutionary biology must mm. be considered suspect. It doesn't sure. mean for sure that it's wrong, 
but right, it has but, to be suspect and require deeper yeah, consider it. So if somebody sure. says to you, avocados are essential to your health and your pregnancy, you go, well, hold on now. The mm -hmm. first time any of us ate avocados is in the last hundred years, 200 years. Right, like, right. They're brand new to humans. So they cannot be essential. It doesn't mean they're mm -hmm. not good. I actually think they are, but they're definitely sure. not essential. So that principle, if everybody just takes that one principle on, I think they can change that. a lot. So then let's go to the, the, the three next things. Um, the next one is also built on a wild fit principle. And the wild fit principle is your health is far more determined by you getting enough of the good stuff than it is by you eliminating the bad stuff. I've heard you say this. I love this one. It's, it's, yeah. Now, yeah. now you can just turn Instagram off because everybody's out there. Avoid these <laughs> seven dangerous food. If it's no, white, get it out of sight. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, it, it, it's all food based yeah. marketing and it works because it's exactly. good bait. But yep. the fact of the matter is the average person is already malnourished. And so if we now take away what, you know, no, we, then we're going to push them to starvation and that's going to lead to relapse and binging. Yes. And no, no, no. So yes. instead, Action step number one that everybody can take is um, to focus on getting their fundamental needs met, getting good mm -hmm. water, getting good air, yeah. getting good nutrition, which comes from seasonally available fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, yeah. and uh, meat, fish, eggs, and poultry if they're in your, if they're in your, in your yeah. experience. That's the first one. Second step okay. is, um, we already shared it, only ever reward emotional states that um that you want to repeat so yeah. never and and you know what i want to share a story which maybe you've heard because i've yeah. shared it before but i want to share it anyway because it hammers love the point to hear it said. two christmases ago i was here and and i had my my girlfriend here the, the, the mm -hmm. most lovely and amazing angel mm -hmm. in the world and her yeah. two daughters who are my stepdaughters and my little mm -hmm. girl who sat and was six mm -hmm. at the time and and then, and then my, my partner's sister and one of her daughters. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing what's going on is we're having oh, a yeah. use of estrogen and estrogen. Oxygen. That's what I was thinking. There's a yeah. lot of estrogen going I'm on. I'm the only yeah. guy in the house. And, um, <laughs> sure, and, sure. All, and, and, and the truth of the matter is it was wonderful. It was just the most oh, amazing yeah. holiday season. It was just, it was fabulous. And then, you know, January rolls around and slowly but surely they start heading back to their different, you know, sure. and, and now I'm, I'm, I, one day the final, the last of them leave and I'm down to, I've just got my little girl. And I've got my little girl on Friday and she's going to go stay with her mom on Friday afternoon. So I'm going to mm -hmm. lose her. And I'm kind of happy about that. Like, I don't sure. mean happy yeah. about you're ready. Her. Like I've had <laughs> yeah. women in my house for like six yes. weeks. It's time for yeah. man day. I'm going to take a right, bath right, and a right. tub of whiskey. I mean, of course not, but you know, <laughs> and I'm going to watch yeah. Liam Neeson rescue his daughter from there. You go. With a Some violence. Guilt. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. But I wake up on Saturday morning and I feel crap. Hmm. I'm depressed and I'm sad and I don't even know why I live a great life. Yeah. What is going on? Yeah. And I walk out of my bedroom and I walk into the living room and I look across the kitchen and immediately my little subconscious mind, we call it the food devil in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in Wildfit. The food devil says, Eric, you have all the ingredients to make grace. Now, grace mm -hmm. is an outstanding smoothie. Oh, and this is a food. Especially when it's frozen. It's this almond food. butter okay. and dates. A sure. little vanilla oh, this extract. Sounds it's delicious. Really good. And it's not even yeah. all that bad for you, but it is sure, a sure. major, major fat and sugar bomb for sure. Good fat, yes, yeah, good yeah. sugar, but. Sure, sure. You know, and, but mm -hmm. here's what I noticed. The minute my voice said that, I started to feel mm -hmm. better. This is an important thing to understand about food. Yeah. I hadn't even started eating the food yet and I'm already starting to feel better. Then my other voice, my food angel says, we don't reward emotional states we don't want to repeat. Yeah. And the devil basically said, the devil was not happy Pissed with off. that talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they, they, I'm now arguing with myself inside. And the angel lays mm -hmm. down the law. And he says, you can only have grace if you have a fantastic day. And the yeah. devil's like, well, that's impossible the way I feel right now. And I started walking right. toward the living room. I'm, I'm just going to go binge watch something on Netflix. Right, right, and then, right. And then the angel goes, Netflix doesn't lead to grace. Right. So what, what might lead to grace? I walk outside into the sun to go onto the beach. Oh, I don't have yeah. any plan, but I know that I need to do something to have a better day. Then I notice that, you know, the tide's coming in and I like making sandcastles. So I'm sitting there on the sand, just kind of half-heartedly making a sandcastle, but awesome. soon I'm actually making a sandcastle and it's big, yeah. 12 feet across. Then the tide yeah. is coming in, it's attacking. And then a crab has moved into the one, Cedric, his <laughs> name was Cedric. And he moved into the, you know, and, and, uh, and then two of my friends walk by and they need a tour <laughs> of the castle because it's so big and they're so impressed. And sure. I've been on this for hours and, 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 I, and I've had all this fresh air and sun. I'm feeling amazing. And they go, do you want to go get some lunch? We walk over to our local, you know, <laughs> beachfront place. We 
have the most amazing lunch. We laugh, we tell jokes, we tell yeah. stories, we share strategies, we have a great time. And I walk back into my house and food angel says, now you can have grace. I don't really feel like it anymore. It's, uh-huh. Yeah. And that's the that's cycle. Wonderful. Right there. So that second principle is only reward emotional states and behavior that you want to repeat. If, if you are feeling sad, call somebody. Don't eat. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, and, and then, um, and the third one is um, build a social structure around you that supports you and your health goals. Huge. One of the biggest breakthroughs huge, huge. we got with Wild Fit was I never coached people one on one. And I, the joke is, mm. I did that because there was no money in it. Like, honestly, if right, I'm, if right, right. Out, People were yeah. willing, we found out, we tested and we found out people were willing to pay $1,500 to do WildFit the way we were selling it 20 years ago. Now, right, right. WildFit can be concierge based. We have some coaches that sure. charge $3,200 for it because they add a bunch mm -hmm. of service. But back then, that was the price point that we found. And, um, and I, I, there was no way to justify that. I couldn't commit that sure. much time. But if yeah. I put eight people in one class, mm -hmm. then $1,500 made sense. But as a bonus of that decision, what we realized and what we found was that the eight class was much better and more effective than one-on-one -on -one mm. because they became they each, each other's other. structure. In the same way you that bet. you go to the gym alone or you go to a gym as a class you, or with a trainer, you push a little harder, Yes. Right? And so, so build a social true. structure of people that are interested in health. Eric, I love that. I love all three of those. And I love the, the principle about um, just really thinking about all these things through and being able to apply. I mean, I like that you gave some practical strategies. I really appreciate that. I'm all yeah. about that. Uh, I also really want to respect your time. I could talk to you forever, but I do want to respect your time. I really, really appreciate you being here and sharing all of, all of your knowledge. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about where, because you do have a book coming out, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, and. I actually have two and, and one we've oh, already okay. talked a little bit about, and that's called the evolution. evolution gap. Gap. And yep. there's kind of a funny story there that I've been working on this, uh, this book for a long, long time. And then I had, mm. a I had a very scary situation happen when I was out with the Hadzabe people once. Um, basically oh. I was, I, it's a longer story for maybe another interview one day, but sure, I, sure. Uh, um, I basically got stranded out in the wilderness with the Hadzabe people f far from everywhere. Oh and I had an out-of-body experience that made me, wow. that somehow allowed me to take all the research that I'd done and put it into a framework. And so I wrote the book, The Evolution mm -hmm. Gap. And then we found that this, some guy issued a press release that he was from Oxford and he was planning on releasing a book on the same topic under the same title. Oh. Oh. And I went to my publisher and I said, look, I want to get this book out really fast. And they said, we just can't hit that cycle. So I got them to sign a release that I could publish it myself um, okay. so that we could just sort of get first to market. And so that book, mm -hmm. The Evolution Gap, but here's the cool thing for anybody listening. Of course, if you're listening to this next year, too late. But if you're listening now, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the version that's up there is basically the director's cut. What I mean by oh. that is that the publishers told us we need to take about 55,000 words out of the book because it's too mm -hmm. long for print. And so mm -hmm. the version that's on Amazon now is like the director's cut. It's the, it's the full, full thing. Oh, it's when the re, okay. The re edit and we actually launch the book fully. It will be, let's say, uh, um, it'll be a cut down version of it. And then there will okay. be a second book where right now it's all up there. So, um, you can go get it on Amazon. We have not launched to any major fanfare. So this is only maybe the second time I've mentioned on the podcast. It's, it's, yeah, there you go. So it's, and you I was going to say, it. I didn't even know it was out. Otherwise I would have said something, but okay, I get it. Yeah. There you go. And there's two ways you can get it. The, one way is if you go to the evolution gap.com, you can pre-order the print version. I can't give you a deadline okay. on when that'll come out, but yeah. that's one way to get it. And then the other way is just to go to Amazon and order the digit, the, the Kindle version that's sitting there right yeah. now. And I kind of prefer you do that one because okay. then you can go write a review and I'd love that. Oh, sure, of course, yes. The, uh, the second book is coming out with Hay House in Mar on March 26th and it's called uh, Post Diabetic. And okay. um, I just wanna share a little bit about my co-author, yeah, go ahead, um, Ruben Ruiz. And mm -hmm. the reason that that's a very important thing is that one of the reasons I didn't write a book earlier is because not a doctor, not right, a PhD. Right. Not sure. a nutritionist. This has all been mm -hmm. self-study. And, you know, and, and the reality is that some people in the population are willing to accept you based on your results, but some people right. want certain pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and so anyway, Ruben, uh, uh, his story was that he's, he was a medical internist. He was a uh, assistant professor of medicine at UCLA and now running three medical clinics in, in, uh, in Southern California. And like mm -hmm. many doctors in America, 40 pounds overweight on 10 mm -hmm. prescription medications, hypertensive oh, wow. type two diabetic. So mm -hmm. he's driving to work one day and he's really tired. So he pulls into Starbucks, gets himself a coffee to try to stay awake, of course. still mm -hmm. falls asleep. Oh, and he's in no. a car wreck. 
Luckily, oh, nobody's wow. hurt too badly. And and a few days later, he's in a rental car because his car's kind of messed up and right. still tired, like he is every day, like he is every mm-hmm. afternoon. And he pulls into Starbucks to guy, buy a, a, you know another bottle, of, another another cup of energy. Doesn't keep him awake. Falls asleep. Gets into another accident. Two in a week. Wow. And wow. at this point, he has a serious crisis of conscience, and he really has to ask himself, "What business do I have being a doctor when I can't even heal thyself?" Mm-hmm. Like he's, right. he's really suffering physically emotionally and also professionally. And so he mm-hmm. found his way onto the internet and he found one of my master classes, And then he mm-hmm. went into the wild tip program. 90 days oh, cool. later, he felt completely compelled to get on my calendar. And there he was on my calendar. And that's how I heard this story. Why? Because he'd lost 40 pounds. He'd reversed his type two diabetes. He'd reversed his hypertension and he got off nine of his 10 prescription medications. And he did it in three months. He got off wow. the 10th prescription medication a few months later. But Mm -hmm. he became absolutely compelled at that point to get this message out of the world because he said Mm -hmm. in all his years at medical school and teaching at medical school, Mm -hmm. nobody, basically the approach was, look, pre-diabetes means you might be able to avoid type two, but once you're type two, it's chronic. Right, right. You can't reverse it, which it is, Mm -hmm. it is um, our our favorite hashtag is post-diabetic is possible. And post-diabetic is a medical condition that we propose exists. And post-diabetic is somebody who was type two or pre-diabetes and mm-hmm. have improved their blood sugar numbers significantly that they are clearly trending in the other direction. And at that point that they are no longer a uh, type two diabetic, they don't recede back to pre-diabetes. They then mm-hmm. become post-diabetic, which means they should not it. be prescribable. They, they do not right. need medication. They're headed in the right direction. And when I introduced this idea to Mark Hyman, I, I'm sure you're familiar oh, yeah. with Mark. I know who he is. Yep. He immediately, mm-hmm. he's like, we were, he and I were talking and I, I, I mentioned mm-hmm. post-diabetic and he goes, that's a really good idea. Can I use that? And I, at that point, I'm like, uh, yeah, but in the meantime, I'm registering the domain. I was like, because it yeah, never exactly. occurred to me that it was. Sure. And so in the end, the book is called Post-Diabetic. Oh, great. Easy to okay. follow, nine-week guide to reversing pre and type 2 diabetes. And my co-author Excellent. is Ruben Ruiz, who is a medical doctor who hmm. reversed his diabetes. So he's the best testimonial in the world. Okay. Excellent. So March 26th, that, it, that will be out. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate everything you're doing. You're you're doing the great work here in the world, I believe. Super interesting guy. Um, I will, at the end of this, do a little conclusion for the listeners, just everywhere they can find you, all your social media and stuff like that. But I really appreciate your time and you sharing all your expertise. No worries. Thanks so very much. Good. good thanks yeah. for having me. And really, it was a lot of fun. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Eric. Uh, like I said, he's a great story storyteller. So that makes it a lot of fun. I also hope you could really pull some practical strategies out of that information, just things maybe that inspire you to try to change uh, something small on the daily basis to just improve your health and well-being. And I'm going to give you Eric's uh, social media. If you want to follow him, follow his work, uh, know when exactly his two books will be released and where you can get them. And I'm just going to read off for you right here so I don't mess this up what his handles are. And I believe as I'm reading this, they're actually all his names. So on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, they are all Eric Edmead. So E-R-I-C, and then Ed Meads is E-D-M-E-A-D-E-S. So Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon. Hi, everyone. Guess what? I have a lovely discount code just for you, my listeners. The code is 10OFF. That's 10OFF, and it will get you 10% off any one of my online courses, which now include... Mastering Mindful Eating, Overcome Binge Eating, Overeating, and Emotional Eating for Good. And I also have a course on When You Want to Stop the Weight Loss Medication, a Comprehensive Guide to Weight Maintenance and Mastery. So if you've maybe lost some weight using a medication and you're now wanting to go off the medication but keep the weight off, this is the course for you. And any course you buy, you keep the course for a minimum of three years, maybe longer. It just depends on how many are purchased. Um, All courses are self-paced, and I promise you they are practical, meaning they don't just tell you what you need to do. You actually engage in the skills and strategies needed to make actual lasting behavior change. You learn how to do the what. 
Okay, all courses have multiple modules with multiple lessons. I'll include lots of examples, tips and tricks to make things simple and clear. And uh, you also get lots of downloadable resources, including the daily planning template that I use with my own clients, the exact protocol to use after a binge or an overeat has occurred to minimize its damage on your body and your mind. There are protein cheat sheets, uh, research-based journaling prompts, and the literal how-to checklists on the skill you are learning about. And with the weight maintenance course, you also have a movement module that will help you figure out how to make a movement plan that fits your particular lifestyle and level of fitness. And you also have a natural appetite regulation mod module. So whether if you have um, never tried an online course to change behavior, or if you have um, I just highly would recommend that you try one of these. I've put my heart and soul into both of them. They are all research-based, and now you can get 10% off. So again, that code is 10OFF. If you're ready to make changes that last, you can go to my website, heatherheinen.com. Heinen is spelled H-E-Y-N-E-N. -E and from the main menu, click Courses, and it will get you to where you want to go. Or you can click on the links in the episode description below the show. And again, as soon as you're there, when you're ready for checkout, just enter the code 10OFF, 10 off. And just a reminder, I also have an ebook cookbook that is now available. It's called Protein Forward Easy Recipes. It includes all high protein recipes, including breakfast and sweet treats full of protein and lunches and dinner. Okay, so again, head to my website. It's probably the easiest thing to do, heatherheinen.com. Heinen is spelled H-E-Y-N-E-N. -E and from there, um, go to courses or the cookbook. And again, use code 10 off at check. Did you know you can find a lot more help from me on my website? Go to heatherheinen.com. Heinen is spelled H-E-Y-N-E-N. -E and there you will find links to my online courses, how I work with clients one-on-one -on -one, as well as online with my coaching and counseling services that I offer. The information in this podcast is intended to provide a broad understanding and knowledge of healthcare topics. This information is for educational purposes only and should not be considered complete and should not be used in place of advice from your physician or healthcare provider. We recommend you consult your physician or healthcare professional before beginning or altering your personal exercise, diet, or supplementation program.